So welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders about the future of crypto. So I'm Brian Crane, and I'm here with Meher. Meher, who's uh, doing a comeback, right, from, from his break from um, cancer. So, so amazing to have you back. <laughs> Thank you. And we're going to speak with Goon, uh, Amy Goon Sayer. Uh, about Avalanche, she's actually been on this podcast um, three times before, uh, and maybe we can start off by briefly mentioning the old episodes we did because it was like uh, interesting sort of through the journey of crypto. But before we get started, uh, just very briefly about our two sponsors. So first of all, uh, Proof of Stake is transforming crypto and you can be a part of it and you can start participating in networks, contribute, contribute to network security and earn rewards by staking with course one. So we're a staking provider with billions in assets, lots of customers on many different networks. So if you're interested in running your own branded nodes, you can also do that. Uh, and you can go to a head of, you can go to course of one to learn about it. And then also Paraswap. So with Paraswap, you can beat the market price. Uh, it's fast, highly liquid, and they just launched a V5, which has a new contract, new APIs. Uh, it's a modular infrastructure, more gas friendly, and supports free approvals using Ethereum permit. And they also recently added support for other networks like Avalanche uh, and yeah, Polygon and PSC. So you can go to Periswap.io and you can get started there. And now with that, let's go to our episodes. Goon, it's so great to have you. Thanks so much for coming back. It's so great to be here. It's so great to see you both. And Meher, so wonderful to be talking to you again. This is fantastic. Thank you, Goon. <laughs> Yeah, I was, uh, I was looking through, like preparing for this, I was looking through the old episodes we did and it's pretty interesting. So we did one in 2015, which was around selfish mining together with Itai. So that was kind of one of the papers looking at, you know, some maybe game theoretic weaknesses around proof of work and Bitcoin. And then we did another episode the same year, which was about, again with Itai, which was about Bitcoin NG. Bitcoin NG was basically this idea for how to scale, uh, you know, transaction throughput on Bitcoin, like by a lot, while basically keeping the consensus algorithm, like fundamentally unchanged. So I, I remember that and I was like, this is so elegant and really cool. And like, why, like, you should like implement that in Bitcoin. And, uh, and so maybe doing this episode with you there. And of course, that was a lot around this this whole block size debate and, you know, there was people like Mike Hearn and Gavin Dreesen and you like trying to get like new ideas into Bitcoin. Uh, so, you know, you were very involved back then. And I think those were like super interesting discussions. And then we had another episode with you, which was the year after 2016 with Vlad Samfir together. And it was right. So, and this thing had launched on Ethereum called the DAO and it had accumulated something like 10% of all the ether in there. And you, uh, you guys wrote this blog post about like, oh, all, here are all the like design flaws and weaknesses of this thing. And actually Meher had also been like writing online about like, oh, this is this other thing that's also flawed. And I was like reading through this. And so then we did this episode. And then of course, right after it's the biggest hack that happened of, uh, in, in Ethereum's history, uh, certainly in terms of the percentage of or the number of ether involved, and that led then the split of uh, Ethereum and Ethereum Cash, oh, Ethereum Classic, and uh, and what was also interesting at a later point, you know, the SEC wrote this paper about the DAO being a security, which was the first uh, kind of the first time the SEC really made a statement about uh, how they view tokens and token sales. Uh, so that was like the year after, and one of the one of the evidence that they quoted in this thing that this was a security was what the way Flat Sampier had described the the curators in our episode. So it was very cool that we had like a podcast cited there. So yeah, such great episodes we have with you, and like great discussions. And then there's been a far too long gap given all the things that happens and all the things that you've done. Because it's been like, yeah, you've done a, a huge amount following that as well. It's been a great ride. It's been a great ride. We lived through, uh, I don't know how many market uh, upturns and downturns together. And, uh, but uh, I remember the very first episode we did together. It was by far the most informed, by far the most challenging conversation I had at that point. 
And it was fantastic. I was like, whoa, look at this. Uh, these guys are asking all of the right questions. It was such a blast. Um, but yeah, it's been five years, I think, since the last episode or something, right? It's, it's five years since 2016. And there has been much that has happened. Layer twos have come uh, and some gone. I mean, nothing ever goes away. So layer twos have come and kind of floundered. Um, new layer ones are here. Uh, there's another batch of uh, competing, uh, competing projects. Lots and lots of excitement. The entire space has grown tremendously, is poised to grow even more. And, um, you know, back when we last talked, it was just people like us. It was just just geeky, geeky people. And, uh, and now it's just uh, I talk to fund managers. I talk to endowments, people who are in charge of endowments and so forth. So it's a, it's a very different, uh, uh, you know, ecosystem out there. And uh, the DAP system is thriving. I mean, we've come such a long way. It's so fascinating, and it's so great to come back to good old friends and and uh, and you know chat about uh, where we are today. So, um, in the in these intervening five years, of course, the big story is, has been Avalanche, right? So, I mean, the, the initial idea and white paper was from a team called I think the Rocket Labs, uh, which the team remains anonymous to this day as far as I'm aware and then um, a month or two after that white paper came out uh, came the announcement that you'll be building it and now you've built it and you've shipped it right and following from Twitter I also saw that um, at some point while starting to build um, Avalanche you decided to take a sabbatical from Cornell where you were a full professor and when I saw that tweet, I was like, wow, that must have been uh, a big decision. Well, what was it like for, for you to take a break from being a, prof prof like, you know, being a full professor there and embarking on a journey like this? It was, it was very straightforward, actually, Mayor. It was very, very simple for me. Um, because, uh, you know, as a professor, you're constantly coming up as at the research university, you're coming up with new ideas, you're coming up um, with, uh, with new ways of approaching problems, and you are working with some of the best and brightest people on the planet. So, uh, so we do this. Um, and you don't necessarily pay attention to product market fit, right? So as a professor, you're there for the academics, you're there for the science, so you're trying to figure out the ways of, of advancing us. So I worked on a bunch of other topics in the intervening five years. So I worked on characterizing decentralization. I worked on characterizing scalability. I worked on a layer two protocol, uh, T-Chan, T-Chain. That's really, really fast. I think it's the fastest layer two protocol. And, uh, but at some point, you work on something that is so big that as soon as you do it, you go, okay, this is, this is, this is important. And, um, and so my whole life, I had been you know, educated, I'd, I'd studied this stuff. I never thought consensus protocols could be fast. I never thought Byzantine fault tolerance could be cheap. And, uh, and as soon as uh, you know, we, we started dealing with the avalanche protocol, we noticed that, hey, this is going to be big. It's just so different from everything that came before us. It's so different. Even other academics don't understand just how, how, how important it is. And, and they can't even fit it into their frameworks because it's just so much, so much better across so many dimensions. So as soon as I had that in my hands, it was a very straightforward decision. I decided to take a break from Cornell. I ended up taking one year of uh, leave of absence formed the company, started uh, building it up. Uh, shortly thereafter, we got some funding from Andreessen Horowitz and uh, from some crypto funds, including Polychain, Naval, uh, and others initialized, you know, Alexis Ohanian, etc. cetera. And uh, so that was a great start. And, um, and then, of course, uh, after that, the rest is history. We, we launched um, about a year ago. I think it's been 14 months. So we're only 13 or 14 months old. It hasn't been that long at all. We're up there with the big boys. We're up there with systems that are far older than us. And, um, and it's, it's been wonderful. And Mayor, I can tell you something else that you maybe don't know. Um, and this might be one of the, one of the places that, uh, that this comes out. But um, back in September, this September, so three years after I took, oh, I should have mentioned, I took a year of uh, leave of absence. I extended it for another year, for two years. 
Then I requested permission for a third year, and uh, Cornell doesn't allow, typically, like it never happens that they give you the third year. They were nice enough to give me the third year, and then at the end of the third year, last September, it was time to make a decision, go back to Cornell or, uh, or stay uh, at Avalanche, stay at Avalabs and work on Avalanche. And, um, and I made the decision. And uh, the decision was to, to be at Alva Labs, to not go back to Cornell. So I've stepped down from my position at Cornell and uh, gave up my tenure and uh, am full-time on Avalanche because I think that's clearly where the, the future is. That's clearly where the most happening place is when it comes to research and development on blockchains. Let's talk a bit, a little bit like what makes Avalanche so unique? And, and are there, like, is it just, in your opinion, is it just unequivocally better than like everything else or like what are the trade-offs that Avalanche has as a consensus? Right. So the issue of trade-offs is very important, right? And uh, people always think like this is like Judeo-Christian values. Like you can't have anything for free. You have to give something up to get something, right? And, you know, that's typically true um, as long as you stay within the same family of, uh, of technologies. So if the goal is to move a lot of earth and uh, you've got a small shovel with a short handle and I invent a big shovel with a longer handle, you know, there's a trade-off there. We're using the same technology, but as you make the shovel bigger, then it carries more weight. You need more strength. As you make the handle bigger, then you have to have even more strength, etc. So that's fine. And then along comes somebody with a steam shovel. That's a different technology. And it has, uh, it completely changes the game. It changes the game, it brings on the industrial revolution. And you go from like being a pleb with a little shovel in his hand to someone who can, who can really excavate the earth. So um, in the case of Avalanche, are there, are there trade-offs? Obviously, there's always some trade-off. But across everything that people have ever said matters to them, Avalanche is a huge step up. It is the third biggest breakthrough in the space of distributed systems. It is only the third time that somebody invented a new family of consensus protocols. The first family, classical consensus, it brought uh, two Turing Awards to the people who, who established that field. And all the hundreds of protocols that followed all descend from that work. So, and everything that you hear that's proof of stake today that isn't Avalanche is using a classical protocol, typically from 1999, sometimes from 1980s. And uh, so protocols like Polkadot, Solana, etc. these are all using classical consensus in which all of the validators collect information from all of the other validators. There is, there is all to all communication. There's N squared communication. So uh, the second big breakthrough was proof of work mining. So Bitcoin and Satoshi came along and they did an amazing job. They changed the consensus protocol and they said, hey guys, there is a better way to do this. It scales much better. It's far more robust, except of course the problem is it consumes a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, power, a lot of electricity. And Avalanche is the third biggest breakthrough. It's, uh, it's efficient, like classical protocols. It doesn't have any mining in it. It doesn't consume energy. It doesn't leak money out of the ecosystem to the miners and to the power companies. And, uh, and at the same time, it's, it's fast. The latencies are, are incredibly low. Uh, we're getting uh, confirmation latencies of 750 milliseconds these days. These are insanely fast speeds. Nobody ever comes close. So... Um, so that's part of what the, the magic that makes it really, really fast. And um, what are the trade-offs? Um, I think there's always some trade-off maybe, but because you're going from some crappy technology to a much better technology, you can be better than what came before you on every metric that matters. The, um, when people ask me what the biggest downside is of Avalanche, I, I do need to be, as a scientist, we need to be upfront with our, our weaknesses. The biggest weakness, is that it's a new protocol. It's not as well established as, say, Bitcoin is. It's not as well established as classical protocols are. So, you know, let's say the Solana, the protocol behind Solana, it's incredibly well understood. So you should be able to write that stuff and get it correct. You should be able to operate that network without downtime uh, forever after. It's not very hard. You can get a master student to write that code. It's doable. Um, but Avalanche requires a little bit of uh, 
you know, a little bit more complexity and, um, and a little bit more nuance. And no one has ever done anything like it before. So there are risks associated with new protocols. I would say that that's the first one. And is it better than other protocols across all dimensions? No. If you have a highly centralized network, if you have a network consisting of, let's say, up to 10 nodes, maybe up to 20 nodes, um, then all-to-all -all communication might be better than avalanche-style communication. So 10 squared is not a very high number. So if you've got 10 validators, then you probably should use, like you can use a, an old school protocol like Tendermint or Solana or whatever. So if all the decisions are being made by a small set of nodes, then you don't want the, the, uh, the avalanche complexity. And in fact, avalanche might be slower uh, because of the way it operates. It might be just better to have a, 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 a multi-round, a fixed number of rounds, three rounds, of all-to-all uh, -all communication, which is what PBFT would do in such a scenario. So, um, so on the very low end, Avalanche might be uh, not suitable for you. But the magic of Avalanche is, as you add more validators, as you build truly decentralized systems, then it outshines the competition by a mile and a half. So uh, it, it scales differently. And if you have thousands of validators, it's so much better than, than the alternative, than the classical protocols. So oftentimes I hear that one of the one of the downsides of Avalanche is that bridging to Avalanche is hard and eventually everything like the way to bridge to Avalanche is to build trusted bridges. And actually the bridge between Ethereum and Avalanche is actually is actually a multi-sig bridge which has been secured by SGX, but it's essentially a set of signers running a running a bridge. Uh, do you think there is any grounds to, to maybe that avalanche consensus makes bridging hard into the ecosystem of other chains? That's an interesting question. So, um, okay, so there is a lot to unpack there. So let me try to unpack it. Um, I think uh, some of you know, the first part of what you said derives from our first bridge. So for the longest time, we were using a conventional bridge uh, that is uh, residing on Ethereum and Avalanche. And the Ethereum side uh, was executing on chain. So it was a regular chain, a regular bridge from Chainsafe. And uh, in fact, it's a, chain, it's a bridge that's used by quite a few other protocols besides us. We found that it was quite fragile. Um, and at times, uh, there were some issues with it that, uh, that we were aware of that could have cost uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, coins to other people who were using the same bridge. So it's, uh, at some point, we decided, hey, we need to ditch this thing and we need to go to a much better foundation. So we built an entirely different kind of bridge based on a very different kind of technology for secure execution. As you mentioned, it's called SGX. It ensures that the bridge operator cannot modify the code of the bridge. The bridge operator cannot gain access to information that's stored inside the bridge. In particular, the bridge operator cannot access the, uh, the all too important secret which controls all the funds that are in the bridge. So the bridge can only do one function. It's got a hash of its code. And uh, as long as that hash remains unchanged, the bridge can, can do only one function, which is take your funds on Ethereum and uh, give them to you on Avalanche and vice versa, the bridging job. So um, that's a first of its kind bridge. Ever since we installed it, uh, ever since we made it public, we've gotten nothing but huge praise. I believe it is the smoothest uh, bridging experience out there. It's fast. It's super cheap because nothing, almost nothing happens on the Ethereum side. You just have to send your funds to the bridge address. So it's just a single transaction. It's a very sim simple transaction, very, very gas efficient, very, uh, very low cost. So, um, so our bridge has been getting praise from everybody. There's also a meme going around, good bridging. So GMGB every morning. Uh, there's a coin that somebody issued to all the bridge users called GB. And uh, it's fantastic to have that as well. So the bridge has really been good. Um, and one concept, misconception I want to correct is um, that it's true that the, uh, the key secret inside the bridge is divided, split, and uh, distributed to four different uh, what we call wardens of the bridge. 
And the reason for that is not technological necessity. So if we wanted to, we could make the bridge completely trustless. We could just have it operate as a black box secured by SGX. The key is only inside the box and it's nowhere else. But that's a little risky. This is brand new technology. We just built it. We are really proud of it. Nobody else, else has anything like it. A lot of other coins are coming to us right now and saying, hey, can we use your bridge, by the way? And, um, uh, but you, you can, if you do this thing that I mentioned, which is where you, where you keep the, the private key only inside the bridge, then uh, if something goes wrong, if there's a bug in the bridge, if there's some mis-execution for whatever reason, uh, then uh, you can get into a situation that you cannot recover from. And that would be terrible. So, uh, so to avoid that, what we did is we, we simply say, look, there's some, some secret here. It's going to control some funds. We will split it up and divide it uh, to independent parties so that um, uh, in case something bad happens, then those same parties can reconstitute the secret and get back at the funds. It's a safety and security measure. It's not a technological necessity. The bridge is, tr is, is not trusted or it can be made completely not trusted and the secret can be made completely local, uh, but that's dangerous. So for a while to come, I plan to run the bridge in this current configuration where the secret is, uh, is distributed to multiple parties um, they're all independent. They are, you know, they've been chosen not to not to be not to collude with each other. Uh, some of the new parties we are planning. So we plan to expand that set of parties, by the way, and we plan to bring in uh, just uh, quite a few uh, bigger players. So, um, but we are very happy with the bridge and how it turned out. I think it represents the best of the bridging technologies out there, the cheapest for sure. Definitely. So, uh, I mean, when you look at like the history of bridges in this in this ecosystem, I mean, in the beginning, the idea behind many of these bridges was that uh, chains would verify each other's consensus, and then there's chain A and chain B, and then some some event X happens on chain B, and then you can submit like a cryptographic proof on chain A. And chain A can verify that cryptographic proof that event X happened on chain B, and then it can take a dependent action Y based on that proof. So we started off with that notion generally. And then and then what happened was like the space accelerated so fast that in reality nobody could really implement these kinds of schemes at a good enough level to be used commercially. So Everything boils down into having, you know, like five signers or 10 signers or 20 signers. And that includes the bridge between Solana, Ethereum, like many bridges around the ecosystem are based on signers, you know, some group of parties that are selected by usually the foundations of the chains that are bridging. And then these, these signers are, are possessing these keys and they're multi-sig accounts on both sides and they're doing the bridging. And now, of course, Avalanche has done a, like a very big, you know, operational improvement on that setup by having the code of these signers run inside SGX enclaves where some guarantees can be made about these enclaves subject to the overall security of SGX itself, which is, which has been a matter of debate in the general computer science and cryptography community for 10 or 15 years. Sure, should we use SGX at all, right? Like. But Avalanche has implemented that into SGX. But do you see in the future a new generation of bridges coming between, say, Ethereum and Avalanche where it doesn't depend on signers, uh, where, um, where there can be something else beyond signers? Or are signers really the edge of human knowledge and the game is about making the signers more and more secure? And that's about all we can do today. Right. Very good question. So, uh, so first of all, let me handle the, the immediate question, which is, um, so what's really going on behind, behind the bridge? Well, what's going on is you need to make sure that something happened on chain A and therefore authorize a corresponding action on chain B, right? So Brian brought his cash over uh, on chain A, and now we have to give him wrapped tokens on chain B, 
or vice versa, he brought his wrapped tokens over, we have to give him the original coins. And so you need to establish whether or not consensus took place. And uh, so there are different techniques for doing this depending on, on what your underlying technology is, but it all comes down to collecting signatures, as you pointed out. Ideally, you would want to collect signatures from everybody on one side who's affected, right? So, um, so on Ethereum, everybody who matters believes that Brian brought his coins over, and then therefore a corresponding action should be, should be authorized. So, uh, so that's a good question. So how do you do that? Um, it's hard to determine everybody who matters. It's hard to, uh, it's also very, very costly to collect signatures from everybody on Earth. Um, if you try to do it, then this act of collecting signatures can itself become a security hole because suddenly people can, can DOS you by asking you to sign a whole bunch of things. So, um, so it's, a, it's a dangerous, uh, I mean, it's, it's a complicated game to play. At some point, most everybody realized, hey, there are only a few people, not few, but there are only so many people on each chain that, that, uh, that, that really matter, like Binance matters. If Binance believes that Brian brought his funds over, that's important. Um, my nodes probably don't matter all that much, but uh, you know, the Avalab, Ava, Avalab's foundation nodes, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, Avalanche foundation nodes, that matters. So um, there, are, there are some people or some nodes that you can identify as, as being important in that ecosystem, and you can piggyback your decisions on them. And that's what most people have been doing. Um, can we can we get to a um, a mode where we don't have these? I think it's hard, Mayor, um, because uh, if you do, like as you start polling everybody, then um, then that is a lot of cost for for everybody, and um, and if, depending on how the bridges are used, that, you know that that those requests may be too way too many in number. There are people working on less trusted bridges. Um, like Axelar is working on one, and uh, there are many others actually currently looking at various different uh, technologies for making that execution faster or cheaper or more interoperable. But uh, I don't know of anybody who will be able to beat the efficiency of an SGX implemented um, execution technology. Now, second point, unrelated tangent, and I think I can say this because I'm an academic. Um, academics love what do they love? They love intellectual challenges, let's put it that way. They love tying their hands behind their back and solving something that's, uh, you know, that, that you could easily solve if you had both hands open, but now that you had one hand behind your back, it's a different thing. They love these Sunday puzzles. And secure, secure bridging or secure uh, execution in an environment where nobody has any hardware support is really hard. It's so challenging. And there are so many academics out there that made a living out of this. They devoted their careers to these kinds of problems. What other pro kinds of problems did they devote their, their, their lives to? You know, there's somebody out there that I, we all look up to, we love, and um, spent a lot of time, multiple years, solving the problem of uh, leader, leader assignment, leader election, and ID assignment in a, in a, in a network that's organized like a ring where none of us have unique IDs. Okay, so, so imagine, uh, so he, you know, essentially he's saying, look, there might well be networks where we're talking a ring. I can only talk to my right neighbor and left neighbor. I need to elect a leader and everybody else needs to say, elect the same leader and none of us have IDs. And this, you know, this gets dozens, maybe hundreds of papers. It's a really interesting problem. And it's really hard to solve, it turns out. But you know how like people how we solve this problem in real life? We just look inside the Ethernet card. Every Ethernet card has a unique number. Okay? The industry makes sure it's unique. That's your unique ID. It was assigned to you. We're done. Okay, so tiny bit of hardware support. It's just obviated years of research. Um, you know, once you have that unique number, leader election is incredibly trivial. All of that work disappears. So now if you go to someone like this who spent many years build, trying to build complicated protocols and algorithms and so forth, and you say, look, I've got this chip, it does secure execution, all your work, you know, it's kind of silly. Um, they will react and say, well, it's got issues with it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, of course it's got issues with it. 
um, SGX has been broken a few times, and every time it gets broken, you know, what? how long does it take? It takes two days, and then within two days, Intel has a patch for SGX. So I wouldn't listen to these academics all that much. They're nihilists. Nothing is good enough. Academics are by nature just like those people in the Big Lebowski. They believe in nothing, right? So remember the nihilists there? And um, nothing is nothing could be good enough, and they always worry about the worst case. Now, the bridge, of course, is a situation where you do have to worry about the worst case, but starting with the premise that the hardware is unhelpful is a silly starting point. So imagine trying to do, imagine trying to do, in, back in the 60s, there were people who were trying to do multitasking on, uh, on regular computers. And it's really hard, and they developed a lot of cool techniques, and they were all proud of them, and, and you know, Multics was doing cool stuff and so on. But then the chip manufacturers come to you and say, hey, we added a feature. We added the, a, a way to save your register set atomically. And then suddenly all these tricks that these people developed are silly, and you just use that primitive to build a system like Unix, and the rest is history. Things just take off. So... Do we need the complexity of all these uh, complicated uh, things? No, I don't think we do. And then final third rant on this topic. I think you are, you are right on when you point out the importance of bridges. I think the next year is going to be a battle of bridges, not the war. The war is, very, is really big. There's like multiple fronts to that war. But the battle is going to be with bridging. And um, you'll see at least a half a dozen new bridge technologies come, come to the scene. And uh, the chains with the best bridges, the most fluid experience, the best user experience, the cheapest experience are going to win, and they will get the TVL, as we've been seeing in the case of Avalanche. So, um, so we're, we're uniquely situated in that battle, and uh, we have by far the best technology, um, and uh, it's going to be fun to see other people try to replicate what we've done. And um, it'll, be, it'll be really interesting. Um, so that's, that's the next year coming up. I'm glad about, I'm very, very happy about where we are. And I just want to give your readers uh, or listeners a heads up about what to expect. Uh, there will be lots and lots of cool cool bridge, bridges come online. There will be some spectacular bridge failures every now and then. And uh, it's going to be a, a fun ride. Cool. That was, uh, that was really, um, really great. And I think that makes a lot of sense. One thing I also wanted to speak about, so there's a topic yeah, I've been thinking more about, is a topic of MEV. Right, so MEV on uh, on Ethereum, of course, is basically miners ordering transactions using basically their sort of monopoly over this block space to do things, and then you know now there's, then there's like you know DApps that try to mitigate that or you know flashbots that try to deal with it, and it's interesting what that looks like in a non proof of work system, in a proof of stake system, or and and with different consensus algorithms too that I think uh, affect this. So I'm curious, like, what what are your thoughts on MEV on uh, Avalanche? What a what, what a great question! I've worried so much about MEV. Um, really, really, really interesting field. So for for people who are listening, so MEV is this thing by which participants to your protocol can jump in and. Um, and extract some value by jumping ahead of other, other natural transactions occurring in the system. You see somebody trying to buy something on, say, Uniswap, you, you, you jump ahead of them, you purchase, purchase ahead from them, and then ahead, ahead of them, and sell to them. Um, and uh, you know, that's a simple kind. Of, you can sandwich their trades, you can do all sorts of things to extract value. Um, on Avalanche, so there are multiple different avalanche deployments or av avalanche protocols or protocols in the avalanche family. And uh, so until I would say maybe uh, June or so, yeah, until about four months ago or so, five months ago or so, we used a, um, a version of our protocol where anybody could propose a block in any slot. Okay, so completely leaderless. And, um, and so... Actually, the current protocol we're using is still completely leaderless. It's still true. What I said is still true. But we added an optimization. So back in June, we added an optimization, and it's been a game changer. If you use the initial avalanche protocol with where anybody can come in at any time, then, uh, then a single MEV extractor uh, with a single stake. So Brian comes along. He buys one, one uh, unit of stake, and... Um, 
and uh, he starts uh, doing whatever he does, he can jump in and he can jump ahead of any transaction in any block. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what could have happened in that protocol and that's what was happening in that protocol. And, um, and we got the idea, we, we heard from the grapevine that there were some people extracting multiple thousands of dollars per day, maybe $30,000 per day, et cetera, from the system. This pales in comparison to what can happen on a chain like Ethereum. On Ethereum, many millions are being extracted via MEV per day. There's a lot of money being made uh, by, by the miners because the miners are in a unique position to, uh, to jump in at any time. So um, on Avalanche, uh, that we noticed that this could have been a problem. We immediately applied an optimization where we slightly favor a uh, given, uh, given proposer in every slot. So, um, you know, so proposer, you know, 37, let's say Brian gets slot 37. He gets a slight advantage in slot 37. But otherwise, he needs to be in line. There are maybe another thousand, uh, you know, uh, miners or, or stakers in rotation. So that suddenly reduced people's ability to jump in. And, um, and so that has had a, an, an immense effect. The amount of MEV extracted from Avalanche, I haven't characterized it, but has, I believe it has uh, dropped down significantly by multiple orders of magnitude. And, uh, and also it creates a nice dynamic. If you want to be in the MEV extraction game, now you have to buy a lot of Avax stake and, uh, and participate in consensus as a first-hand consensus member. So that's been, uh, that's been a great change and, um, and it made the protocol even more resilient. But at the end of the day, there is one defense against MEV extraction that is, um, that is incontrovertible. It's the best defense. And that is, if you have a fast protocol, then MEV extraction becomes really hard. So when your protocol is lagging, let's say, 15 seconds behind real time, like it is with, uh, with uh, Ethereum, then there's so much MEV to extract. You know the future, right? People submitted transactions 15 seconds ago, and there you are uh, about to craft your block as a miner in Ethereum, and you can do whatever you want because you know how the price has changed in the intervening seconds. And uh, in the case of Avalanche, we are by far the fastest chain. We're the only chain that goes from submission to completion in less than a second. Our uh, time to finality is 750 milliseconds these days. So we go from initial injection to, to being completely done with the transaction in, uh, in the blink of two, in just two blinks of, of the eye. So like you do this and it's done. And so it's so fast that the value to be extracted is much lower. That's uh, at least an order of magnitude faster than, uh, than uh, other chains. So it's an order of magnitude faster than Ethereum. It's an order of magnitude faster than Solana. So that's, uh, that's how you, I think, eliminate most of the MEV. And then these other optimizations at the protocol level, uh, they create a nice dynamic. Whatever remaining value there might be uh, goes down uh, substantially. So um, we've, uh, we've, we've, done, we've done a bunch of things, as I mentioned. So we are naturally... Uh, I think possess low value, and uh, with just a small optimization, we managed to uh, turn the game upside down and uh, and force the MEV extractors to have to hold uh, a lot of stake, which is a great thing for the the Avox token holders. So, I mean, back when Avalanche was very early on, right? So, one of the things that I that I loved about Avalanche is that it was the first like leaderless consensus algorithm by which like what do we mean when we say leaderless consensus algorithm in bitcoin every 10 minutes there's a winning miner and the winning miner has a block and then it can put transactions into the block and it has full you know full volition about which transaction it puts in and then then came a generation of proof of stake protocols which includes tendermint which includes solana which adopted you know, these other family of consensus algorithms that you mentioned earlier, uh, based usually on practical Byzantine fault tolerance from 1999, uh, where, where there's, there's again a leader and that leader keeps rotating 
and there's a leader schedule where you know who the leader is going to be uh, and whoever is the leader can put transactions in the block and can can order them and in avalanche um what was very very impressive like very early on was that is anyone can propose a block and then the network can will come to consensus on one of the blocks and it will discard the other blocks but this consensus will be built ground up by the polling that's done by by the various nodes themselves and then it seems like what happened there seems like what happened was that um when anyone can propose a block then maybe the network could split into validators that are naive that are not able to not trying to extract mev at all because they're just downloading some software and running it and then there are like some very sharp validators that are trying to extract the mev they can try to position themselves in the network in ways that they can influence which block ends up becoming finalized um and and they can try to extract mev and to sort of defend against that avalanche has somewhat of a leader schedule now except that maybe leader scheduling is not as strict as you know you know tandem in tandem it's very defined a is leader yeah, then b is b whereas in avalanche it's like well if it's a then b then c but if if a proposes then they have an advantage but if a doesn't send the block then x or y could send the block and theirs will get accepted it is exactly it is like a weak exactly. le leader schedule yeah and so with this weak leader schedule what what's happening is sort of like avalanche in my mind is kind of like becoming equivalent to you know tendermint or solana or eth2 in terms of mev because they're still uh, in terms of mev no no it's it are we becoming equivalent no um let me see let me think about that um in some sense in some sense so um uh is that what's happening no i thought about this before and my conclusion back then was no it's going to forever be a, a different profile um and uh, hang on but i do need to recreate my uh, my thinking one of the things i love about talking to you guys is uh, we just kind of talk so i didn't come into this knowing what questions you would ask me so uh, so bear with me as i try to think this up on the spot so um if uh if we were to take a look at uh, a system like uh, whatever tendermint let's say versus um versus avalanche uh with with the weak leaders uh, in place then um uh yeah no there that that's true that uh, the weak leaders do give an advantage to a chosen person per slot that's definitely true and in that sense we are similar to what's happening on other chains um the, there's still a huge difference between being a chain that takes let's say uh you know in the case of Solana like 15 to 20 seconds to uh, I think 12 seconds whatever the number is um 12 12 to 20 seconds to finalize versus uh, a system like Avalanche that's taking less than a second to finalize so that's a huge reduction in MEV the entity that can extract MEV does change and um in a leaderless system, anyone can extract MEV at any time. And with a weak leader, then there's a, there's a dedicated person, there's a designated person who is in a favored position per slot and other people will find it very difficult to extract MEV. So I think that change, that optimization for Avalanche with weak leaders was a good one. Uh, it drastically reduced the amount of MEV extraction. It changes the way you extract MEV as well. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, we can talk about this at length. And um, the bottom line is, you know, what's the slippage you get when you go to Avalanche? When you go to, you know, you've, you've bridged over, you're going to use Pangolin instead of uh, Uniswap, or you're going to use Trader Joe or Yeti Swap or Can Canary or whatever, um, instead of uh, whatever people were using on Ethereum. So what's, what's the slippage you get? Who jumps ahead of you? And, uh, and how, much, how much worse execution do you get? And... Um, at least at the moment, I can just look empirically 
and uh, and you know my eyes don't lie to me. The the execution on on Avalanche is incredibly good compared to what happens on uh, on uh, let's say Uniswap. Every single bit, uh, every single Ethereum miner is extracting MEV right now, all of them, and. Um, the way the Avalanche network is, there are so many people who are securing the network. And so many of these people are first-hand participants in the network that they just will not do any of these uh, attacks. So um, that's, I think, the big difference. When you have a designated miner class, you have these people who are sharks. You know how miners are, right? They're there for the money and only the money. They are not really forward thinking. They have some calculations they've made. And if someone comes along and says, here is, uh, here is some, uh, you know, here's some trickery that allows you to make more money, they all jump and start using that, that trickery. So uh, that's what's happening on Ethereum. And I see no reason for why that should change. We've seen this in the case of Bitcoin miners as well. They are completely profit driven. So they will do whatever makes sense for their profits. And um, in Avalanche, the way the protocol is, the vast majority of the stake is not extracting, uh, is not extracting, you know, my nodes are, are never going to extract MEV from any user. So when it's, it's their time to propose blocks, they will do whatever is right. So that's, I think, a, a fantastic situation to be in, and uh, the MEV to be extracted is far lower than, uh, than a system like, uh, like Ethereum. No, that definitely makes sense. I think, like, that's one of the big differentiators of of Avalanche, which is like it's not a very delegation heavy system where in, 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 in other proof of stake systems because you have usually have limitations on the number of validators. Like in a tendermint chain, like you probably shouldn't go above 150 validators. So there you have to have delegation where I as a holder of tokens am delegating my voting power and consensus to a particular commercial entity. And then when there are these commercial entities, then uh, of course they will have professional MEV extraction systems, if not today, then eventually, right? Like the, the Nash equilibrium is, is sort of everyone runs an MEV extraction system and distributes that via lower commissions or something, something else, right? Um, but in, in Avalanche, because Essentially, there is not a limitation on the number of validators. Anyone who has coins can become a validator. And so um, the hope can be that, well, at least a certain fraction of the network that is regular people running validators won't have professional MEV extraction systems. Now, that can be the hope. Now, of course, like there's going to be entities like, I don't know, probably Binance has a lot of avalanche tokens or the exchanges will have a lot of avalanche tokens and they'll have an avalanche validator and they'll end up running MEV extraction systems in the future. But a pro probably a bigger fraction of the avalanche network compared to other proof of stake networks might be one where people are still running like naive code with no MEV or something like that. So that could be, that could definitely be a structural advantage in, in avalanche. One one curiosity I I have about you know Avalanche is like it's not a technical curiosity anymore. It's like uh, in the in the beginning, right? Like there was Bitcoin and then there was Ethereum, and these were there was a point where like the, these were the only two that mattered, and there was an earlier point where it was just Bitcoin that mattered, and kind of both of us have seen those points in history. And, um, you know, um, and now there are so many chains. Most of them don't matter. Most of them don't matter. But yet it's like, even in the chains that matter, you see that like they are starting to develop very distinct personalities. Now, for example, I, I couldn't go to the conferences in Portugal, but, um, but my friends tell me that there was a Cosmos conference and there was a Solana conference. And my friends tell me that when you went to the Cosmos conference, it was like, you know, a bit like the earlier crypto nerds kind of hanging out kind of atmosphere. But when you went to the Solana conference, it was like, it was like very business-like. And uh, you can see that it's like, 
I mean, there are like Wall Street firms that are now trading on Solana. And you can feel like, oh, there's this Wall Street energy that's like, you know, like coming into, into that chain. And it's, it's a different atmosphere. It's kind of a different community. And, you know, like it's like a different go-to market as well. Did you see the discussion they had? Um, I saw a picture from, you know, they have different sessions and, uh, and different lectures. They had one lecture on Solana and decentralization. Giant room, maybe like 15 people in it. So, uh, so that tells you about, uh, about how much they care about decentralization in Solana, in the Solana community. That was, uh, that was an interesting sight to see. So you are absolutely right. All these chains are developing their own personalities, their own ecosystems, their own user groups. So, um, so I'm, I'm curious where you're going with the question. So uh, yeah, and I'm like, yeah, what's the, you know, like what? I mean, one way of stating is what is like, you know, what what do you think is like the target market for Avalanche? Like, what kind of community or distinct subculture of projects is Avalanche cultivating? Or, I mean, one is like top-down cultivation, what would you like, but what is also like, what's what do you think is happening bottom-up? Yeah, what would I like and what's happening? That's, that's actually, I haven't thought about that too much, but I can tell you what's happening on in the trenches. Um, we have a very strong user community. We have a lot of crossover projects. Uh, we have a bunch of projects that got funding from, uh, from Polkadot or from Solana even, and uh, decided that, hey, we need an EVM chain and uh, these things don't actually work that that got that funded us and so um you know solana doesn't support the evm and polkadot makes a lot of noise but doesn't didn't actually support uh, smart contracts at the time at least so uh, so we have a bunch of people coming over um with uh, with built contracts and so forth so how do i characterize the average avalanche user that's a great question i would say that because of my reach um, there's a fair number of people who are technically savvy. So a fair number of CTOs, CIOs that, uh, that got in very early and they understand the, the true uh, revolutionary nature of the technology. That's been wonderful to, to have. There is a large number of people who came to Avalanche because it's cheap. So there's a large number of people who are overseas and they, they kept watching all these Westerners, all these Europeans get rich and richer and richer and richer on Ethereum, and they were cut out. You know, right now you can't do a trade on, on Ethereum on an AMM and pay less than 100 bucks. It's just, you know, the slippage of the, plus the fees is going to be pretty nasty for you. And uh, if your entire budget is $200, you're not going to pay like $50 in fees or $100 in fees. So those people were cut out of DeFi. They had no place to go. And so Avalanche attracts a fair number of these people. And it has for them uh, been a godsend I get every day. I get a whole bunch of messages saying this has been a life-changing experience. Da, da, da. And not only because of Avax coin appreciation, which it has done really well, but also because we gave them an ecosystem. We gave them a home. We gave them an accepting place. And the people who want to run a validator, we, 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 you can just run a validator. You don't have to partake in a para swap auction, or not para swap, para, para chain auction. That's ridiculous crap. That's just like stuff for the rich. So, uh, so you can get into these situations and, um, and be a meaningful member of the Avalanche community. So we attract a lot of people who couldn't do that elsewhere and they came to us. We have, a, as I mentioned, a technically savvy community. Um, you know, go into our channels and you'll find a fair number of very, very, very informed, intelligent people who understand how these protocols work, what the differences are. Um, the other thing, I guess, I would say that a lot of our users are new to crypto. Um, you know, we brought a bunch of new people in. Uh, the area also grew uh, during the pandemic. So maybe everybody else also has this, I don't know, but I do know that there's a fair number of people for whom Avalanche is the first coin they owned. And uh, that's an interesting situation. Such people tend to be a little bit more skittish. Uh, they tend to be, you know, when there is the usual China FUD or Russia FUD or India FUD, uh, they, they freak out a little bit more. If you have a bug in your system, they think that's the end of the world. They don't understand that these things happen with some regularity and they get fixed. Um, 
but what it is, whatever it is, uh, it's just part and parcel of having a lot of uh, a lot of new people. Um, so those are, I think, my three uh, characterizing uh, points. Uh, there are there used to be we were mostly relegated to techies, but now traders are coming in, and traders come in based on two things. The traders come in when they see another another person with deep pockets. They like to ape. You know, they see a rich person doing something, they're like, hey, this guy must be doing something right. So, you know, that's fine. That's that's a silly behavior. That's But, you know, they do it. That's fine. The other thing they do is they come in because the on-chain metrics are in their favor. If you look at our TVL and, and our market cap, we have the highest TVL per market cap. Okay, so I can't really comment on the price, but people people who've got uh, lower TVLs than us have uh, higher market caps. So we're in a very good situation. High TVL is fantastic. Uh, people who see our growth patterns, they come in. So more frequently, these data-driven uh, traders have been coming into uh, to, uh, to Avalanche, and that's, been a, that's a very different community. So they may or may not understand the, the revolutionary nature of the underlying technology. We also have quite a few, um, I would say, normal people. So just this is very important to me. And this is actually one area where I, I strive to differentiate us. Almost all of crypto is, has been appealing to the same kind of anti-establishment, anti-everything crowd, right? You know, they, they want to break down society. They want to break down the, the dominance of the dollar and, and have say, Bitcoin in, instead, or the Ethereum folks. You know, I've heard crazy things. Like, oh, what if, what if we build a system that is used to store, you know, terrible, terrible content? You know, it's okay. Maybe that would be okay. And this was coming from, from very high on up. And that's, that's, that's not where we are coming from. Um, I think I want to, or, you know, if you, if, if you wanted me to, to position us, I would position us slightly to the... Uh, the more humane side of where crypto is today. So none of this like, uh, you know, you lost your coins, what's it to me? Or I got mine, so screw you type, type people. But more of the, how are you doing? I, 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 I know I will do well and I want you to do well in life as well type of people. And more of the, you know, I could, I could go buy Ethereum and I could, I could pretend that Ethereum is Ethereum 2, all the while knowing that Ethereum is actually Ethereum 1. Ethereum is a proof-of-work coin. It is as disruptive and terrible for the environment as Bitcoin is. You know, so there's a huge disconnect in, in some circles there. And it's, uh, it's a little painful to watch. So all these people who, you know, ostensibly they seem to care about things, ESG concerns, right? So they care about the environment. They care about social impact, supposedly. And then they go and... And, 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 and use technologies that are, you know, 10 years old at this point. Proof of work is 11 years old. It's terrible for the environment. You should not be touching a coin like that uh, if you care the least bit about the environment. You want to leave a better spot for the... I mean, you can't be using 1% of world's electricity to mine your coin. And um, that's what Bitcoin and Ethereum combined do. So... Uh, so that's, um, that's one area where I would like to make sure that we are, everybody perceives us as being different. You know, we are a fast chain, we're a high capacity chain, we're a very versatile chain, and uh, the people who understand our subnet infrastructure, etc., the techies know this, the normies will take a while to understand. But most importantly, I would like to attract delightful, normal, reasonable people. People who don't want to break down society as we have it. People who want to essentially preserve what we have, but make it much more efficient, make the rails more efficient, cut out the fat. Like even as I speak right above the laptop, I'm watching Wall Street. And, uh, and those people, you know, they, they are, they're the gatekeepers. They collect rent. They collect, they don't give you service. They, in fact, give you poorer service. They jump ahead of your, your, uh, your order flows, right? So, um, so people who want to cut that out and uh, leave a better world for, for their children, those, those are the kinds of people I would like to attract. So, um, and, and I've done everything, everything I know to do, everything imaginable at the protocol level um, to, uh, to, to build something that will appeal to them inherently. And, um, and from now on, 
It's just a game of uh, mostly sitting back and letting the sort of the usual percolation of ideas take hold and, and have people understand what it is that we have. Uh, because I do, you know, it's, it's, I think, clear to me that we have something that's far superior both technically to other proof-of-stake coins and also value-wise uh, to, uh, to, uh, to at least some of the big inc incumbents in the space. Right, yeah. And really, best of luck, going for the journey that's, that's there to come. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, best of luck to you as well. This has been such a blast. I've, I've so thoroughly, I was not expecting to see you today. So great to see you beat cancer. So great to see you, to, to have a great chat with you as always, as if it's just, you know, five years ago from where we picked up, from, from, uh, from where we left off and uh, continue the conversation. So great to see Mayor back. So great to chat with you again. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully we can do another one of those, you know, not, not so far away. Five years is definitely like way, way, way too far. So I think that would be fun. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what's, you know, happening in, in the Avalanche ecosystem. We have our, at, at our company, of course, well, we have a few people who are like uh, quite into it. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, I'm also excited because it, it does feel like a very, it's very elegant, uh, some of the design. So, and uh, yeah, I've been, Big fan of your work for so many years. So it's, it's very exciting to see how this is coming to so much fruition now. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me, guys. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, look, looking forward to, uh, to growing the space with you all, educating people and uh, making, uh, you know, just essentially, I, I should maybe mention this at the, in the closing. Our goal in Avalanche is to bring into the space uh, the many hundreds of trillions of assets that are not in blockchain form. And uh, the space only grows with, uh, with, with more and more value coming into it. We built our infrastructure to allow that. Um, I talked about the scalable consensus protocol. We didn't talk about subnets. Maybe we'll talk about them. Uh, we can talk about them at a future discussion. But uh, we have an infrastructure that allows us to, uh, to, uh, to create essentially blockchains for custom use cases um, that are open or semi-open or maybe closed, depending on the use case. And, um, but interoperable. And so, um, so we're in a, in a unique position to be able to absorb that growth. And we're also working uh, to invent new, uh, new assets. So uh, we, we, we recently came up with something called ILOs, Initial Litigation Offerings. Those are fun. And um, so uh, in every way, I've been trying to grow the space. I've been trying to bring into it uh, the people who bring value with them. And... Uh, and I just can't wait to see the space flourish in the next uh, decade to come. It's going to completely transform what we do. Yeah, cool. Well, then with that, thanks so much, Kuhn. It was amazing. And I look forward to having you back on soon. Take, take care, guys. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Best of luck.